Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our host, Kennedy Center Artistic Director for Jazz, Jason Moran. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts here in the Concert Hall in Washington, D.C. It's 2016. <laughs> yeah. This is the 2016 National Endowment for the Arts Jazz Masters Tribute Concert. Tonight we celebrate four individuals, each whom have contributed mightily to the music in their own unique ways, each of them a jazz master, each of them an important voice in our community that shapes our music and our world. First, a young man who grew up in Philadelphia where his sharp ear for the stories of the people propelled him and his saxophone to the great heights in the music where he remains to this day, traveling the world and performing with his tenor saxophone. Next, a native of Indiana whose love of the music has led him to create innovative techniques on his instrument, the vibraphone, where his prowess continues to influence generations of followers, followers and players in his footsteps. Third, a son of the South whose humble beginnings held no indication of his future as an important artist and saxophonist, a soft-spoken man whose distinctive sound and gentle spirit continue to speak volumes through his spiritual expression. And finally, a harmonica playing blues loving ballerina who danced her way from Brooklyn via the subways of New York to become the music's most passionate and advocate for the health and welfare of the jazz community and its artists. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, this is the 2016 class of NEA Jazz Masters. Make it loud, make it loud, make it really loud. To start off our evening, the special evening, with our first salute, please welcome the Chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, Jane Chu. Thank you, Jason, and good evening. On behalf of the National Endowment for the Arts, welcome to this evening's tribute concert. This is the 34th year of the NEA Jazz Masters, and we have the opportunity to honor the remarkable accomplishments of a very special group of jazz leaders and welcome them to the NEA Jazz Masters family. This is also a special year for the National Endowment for the Arts because it's our 50th anniversary. And yes, thank you. We're so pleased to be able to celebrate the NEA's milestone birthday here in Washington, D.C. and at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. So many thanks to President Deborah Rutter, Artistic Director for Jazz, Jason Moran, and all our friends at the Kennedy Center for collaborating with us to produce this evening's special event. I want to welcome all of you who are joining us this evening via live stream. You can connect to the live stream on the NEA's website at arts.gov and also on the websites of the Kennedy Center and NPR, National Public Radio. And if you want to join the conversation online, you can follow us this evening on several Twitter handles at at NEA Arts or at Ken Sen or at NPR Music by using the hashtag NEAJazz16. So our audience tonight includes some people new to jazz, and we are thrilled to have you here, but it's also full of people who just love jazz. Citizens from all walks of life that are fueled by being part of wonderful musical experiences like those that are in store for us tonight. And also with us tonight is a person with a very significant leadership position for our country in her role as Attorney General of the United States. Please join me in recognizing the Attorney General of the United States, Loretta Lynch. Thank you. 
so let's get started. Legendary saxophone player and vocalist, pianist, poet, playwright, educator, and composer. These are just a few of the words that describe Archie Shepp, the first 2016 NEA Jazz Master we're honoring. Archie was raised in Philadelphia, and he went on to study drama in college, but it was ultimately in music that he found his stride, and ever since, Archie Shipp has used his music as a means of expression, as a voice for the people, and as a way to push this art form in new directions. Archie's music incorporates a wide range of styles, from the traditional to the cutting edge, including American blues, spirituals, and original works. And through these forms of expression, Archie continues to raise our political and cultural consciousness. And in just a minute, some of Archie's longtime friends, as well as younger artists he has inspired, are going to take the stage to perform a medley of two of Archie's works, Hambone and Blues for Brother George, which was written about activist Soledad brother George Jackson. But first, let's watch this short film that illustrates why Archie Shepp is a true master of jazz. I think Archie Shepp has, has always talked boldly about the black experience, period. Well, he's bringing his life experience, and Archie was very connected. He had the raw statement that he's been refining and refining ever since without losing the drive. I saw how serious he took the music, as if he was a, a brain surgeon. Even to this day, I'm still amazed that Archie is constantly practicing. My father played the banjo, so he was really a, a blues man, and I yeah, was really totally taken with the music that my father played for me on the radio. And he listened to everybody, and so by the age of 13, I knew I wanted to, to play this music. I wanted to learn how to play the saxophone above the high F, uh, as it's written. In conversation with one of my schoolmates, I asked him, uh, have you heard any, do you know of any saxophone players who, who play above the, the notes above the high F? And he said, well, there's a guy in North Philadelphia named John Coltrane. I lived just around the corner from the five spot and I used to be there every night to hear him. And one night I, I got up enough nerve to ask him if he would show me some things on the saxophone. And he very graciously uh, accepted. And uh, in fact, my meetings with John were frequently not exchanges on the horn, but we would just talk all day about people he appreciated and liked. He was like a big brother to me, a brother I never had. Archie always was a uh, fighter. His approach to music started to influence the whole young people. I was very aware at a very young age the need to be involved. Well, I hear my father and the man next door talking about these, these problems all the time. Not only was there poverty, but uh, there was a great deal of crime and, and violence but a lot of music and a lot of blues and some good times. I suppose that's what jazz is all about, suffering and good times and some, somehow making the best of all of that. It's only natural that that's what came. Looking for the sun. Archie to me is like a father in terms of musically. He has a wider range of concept of choral structure, of form. Archie would write some things that were almost kind of like doo-wop. And I was like, okay, this kind of gives me permission to not just worry about one area. Just let me be a musician. I met Cecil Taylor in the the early 1960s. He opened up a, an entirely new set of uh, options uh, for me as far as playing music without chords, 
playing music, changing tempi. Uh, I learned from him that uh, black music, uh, not only black music, but, but the jazz music, if you will, could, has a, a number of uh, uh, possibilities uh, as far as its rhythm, its meaning. It was things like this that made me reflect on the importance of my people's music and that it not only had how it had influenced us, but how it had influenced pe people all over the world, that it had international dimensions and implications. Archie always had the revolution inside of his word. You know, Mama Rose, Mama Too Tight. It was always something coming out that had something to do about suffrage, something political. Archie was one of the first people I met in my life who was really personifying that, uh, that crusade for more human rights. Archie was very political and he wrote Attica Blues expressing about the people who were killed there wrongfully. Attica Blues was one of the first political musical statements of my generation. Powerful, devastating, full of rage and full of beauty at the same time. Music has always been a balm to the soul. Misery and suffering has never been the province of any one group. The music undergoes a constant metamorphosis. The only thing we have to do is keep swinging. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ambrose Akinmusari, Roswell Rudd, David Murray, Rudresh Mahanthapa, Jason Moran, Linda O, oh, Kareem Riggins, and Pedrito Martinez.
Ladies and gentlemen, 2016 NEA Jazz Master, Archie Shep. Thank you very much. Thanks to all the guys in the band and, and the ladies. To the guys and the girls in the band, I give my thanks. I'm really quite thrilled to receive this award and to be in such good company. Gary Burton, my main man, Pharaoh, Wendy Oxenhorn. I, it's certainly a pleasure. And, uh, I beg your pardon? <laughs> I thought I said Pharaoh, didn't I? Yes, I did. Yeah. And well, we go back a long way, and he's really like a brother to me. Finally, we might ask ourselves, what is the meaning of the arts and humanities? if they are only available to a class of people. What is the relevance of jazz music if it reaches no further than middle-class homes that can afford musical instruments and musical instruction, music instruction? It is essential that our schools, universities, and institutions reach out to the ghettos, the wretched communities which frequently languish outside their doors. They must create hope 
where there is despair. Unless this world will become what you see, a virtual reality show. Hilarious, but for its tristesse. An anticlimax, replete with crime and madness. Thank you. Thanks to the guys and girls in the band. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Archie Shep, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kennedy Center President Deborah Rutter. Thank you, Jason. And I extend to all of you my welcome as well. We love having you here at the Kennedy Center. And those words that Archie just shared with us are inspirational and ones that we should all come together and rally around. I look to all of you as citizens of our world, citizen artists, to step forward and help bring the arts to every single person in our society because it is only through the miracle of what we've just heard and the miracle of what we will hear the rest of this evening that we truly can make the world a better place. So it's a thrill to have you all here. Now, somehow, miraculously, you are all here this evening, so you know that jazz has a rich history here at the Kennedy Center, notably under the leadership of the late NEA jazz master, Dr. Billy Taylor. He preceded Jason as our artistic director for jazz, and he was here for 15 years building the program from a handful of concerts in the mid-90s to a robust array of annual concerts, school initiatives, lectures, film screenings, and of course, lots of digital content. Now, under the truly brilliant leadership of Jason Moran, who's been with us since 2011, Kennedy Center Jazz continues to highlight both traditional and more contemporary expressions of the music including several concerts every year which regularly feature up-and-coming artists as well as the NEA Jazz Masters. Next season, for instance, you might just catch a certain someone who will be playing here later tonight as we might mark the 90th birthday of NEA Jazz Master, Jimmy Heath, right here in the concert hall. We would love to see you here just this October. Please join us. There's so many happenings here in the center, all circling around J uh, Jason's great ideas for jazz. I'd like to say thank you to Chairman Jane Chu and the National Endowment for, for the Arts for having our celebration here tonight. This is a first Jazz Masters Tribute event presented here, and I'm hoping it might just come back again. This is a great place for it. Just putting in a good word there, Jane. So now on to a tribute. Um, speaking of firsts, of course, brings to mind our next awardee, Gary Burton. I see you, Gary. As a young man in Indiana, listening to recordings of vibraphonists playing with just two mallets, Gary Burton decided he was going to do something unheard of at the time, to play with four mallets. Indeed a first. Not only did this innovative and radical change in technique bring a fuller, more robust sound to the instrument, but it forever influenced all vibraphonists who have followed Gary's lead. 22 Grammy Award nominations and seven Grammy Awards later. Gary's <laughs> 
Gary's quiet and always generous leadership belies his incredibly prominent status within this field. While his notable contributions in other genre have included country, rock, classical, and even tango, it is his duo partnership with fellow NEA jazz master Chick Corea that always gets people talking. So that Korea composed title track from their 1972 ECM recording, Crystal Silence, is up next but right after this film, showing why Gary Burton is a first-class musician with first-class talent and absolutely an NEA jazz master. Gary. When you look at the history of the Viber family, Gary Burton is one of the most dominant voices of that instrument in the history of jazz. He, he's one of the titans. He's an amazing amazing artist and musician. He has the, talking about the spirit of improvisation and spontaneity, I mean, as soon as he picks those mallets up and starts to weave his magic, it's very unique. Well, I grew up in southern Indiana. I had started playing the vibraphone and the marimba when I was six. I didn't know anything about jazz at first, but somehow I stumbled across a jazz record. It was by Benny Goodman. And they were doing this thing, uh, which we now know as improvisation. I was fascinated by that. My first big influences turned out to be piano players. In particular, one of the leading innovators of the day was Bill Evans. I listened to him play and I thought, if he can do that on piano and make it so musical, then surely I can do something similar on vibraphone. Gary Burton took this mechanical thing <laughs> and just exponentially expanded the possibilities of what it could do. True innovators come up with something, do something in a way that totally changes everyone else's life, <laughs> everyone's approach to the instrument. Gary Burton, beyond a shadow of a doubt, is one of the greatest innovators on the vibraphone, or one of the greatest innovators in jazz altogether. Gary has developed this unique four mallet technique that he uses, that he almost makes the vibraphone sound like a piano sometimes. I started playing in 1949, so it was 20 years old, and I would try to play the piano. It encouraged me to start playing the vibraphone with four mallets instead of two. I played alone a lot because of where we lived, and it sounded too empty. I needed harmony. I wanted it to sound complete, and, and it became my way of playing the vibraphone. I think this is a sort of brilliant in-between of sort of jazz, sort of not really rock, but just this great style of music that kind of transcends all of these so-called genres. I looked at the audiences we were playing for and noticed that I was 25 and they were 40 and 50. I needed to find a younger audience, my age group. I had the idea to somehow combine rock and jazz. The music press started calling the music fusion jazz. It's endured now for, what, 30, 40 years, and still is, is kind of a, a genre of jazz. Me and Gary, we go back to, uh, gee, I know we have slightly different stories about when we met and how we started, but certainly the late 60s. I've been lucky to have a few collaborations in my career that have lasted for years and years. And a lot of great music has come out of each of them. Uh, certainly the most significant has been with Chick Corea. It was a concert of soloists. Gary played a vibe solo, I played a piano solo. So at the end of the show, the audience was really responding. They wanted an encore and nobody knew what to do. And the vibraphone was out on the stage and, and uh, I said, come on, let's go jam, me and Gary. And that's how we started. And our relationship musically just continued from that point. Within 10 minutes, it's like we've been playing all along. We've been doing that all these years. It's just a unique thing that the two of us happen to find each other. So many great musicians have come through his bands through the years. Gary Burton, in his own way, he's been doing the same sort of thing that Art Blakey and Betty Carter and, and Ray Brown would do in kind of nurturing these young up and coming musicians. There is a long history of mentoring in the music world and especially in the jazz world. 
We have a big responsibility to pass on our experience to the, the next generation who are going to be carrying this on into you know, the future of jazz. Not just a great player, great composer, band leader, but again, great educator, great mind. While I'm proud of my own accomplishments, I'm also really proud of the things that my students have managed to do and the things that they continue to create and produce in their own musical careers. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome NEA Jazz Master Chick Corea and Stefan Harris.
Ladies and gentlemen, 2016 NEA Jazz Master Gary Burton. Chickaria Stefan Harris. Thank you. I've been playing that song with Chick for over 40 years, and it's a weird sensation to sit out there and watch it from the other side. And, uh, I, and I could tell Stefan, you now know that feeling of being tossed into the cage with a tiger when you play with this guy. <laughs> um, this is a real honor to be part of this whole event. And I'm really struck by this history of jazz that we're all a part of, and this sense that it's constantly moving, constantly evolving. This generation uh, that Chick and I are part of, uh, we were around when the pioneers, the originators of jazz, were still with us and still performing and we learned from them directly and personally. We saw them play live many times, got to know them. And uh, I feel like we're in a unique position to carry on and pass on what we've learned over our years and uh, help uh, the younger generation that follows uh, on their way to building the future of this music. This is a great honor to be part of jazz music itself, and wow, what an honor to be part of this tonight. Thank you. Awesome, really awesome. Well, what can I say about Pharaoh? <laughs> and um, for me, it gets very personal, what I'm about to say. Uh, my interest in Pharaoh Sanders goes back a long way, 41 years, I'm 41 years old. Uh, <laughs> you see, my parents love to tell this story of when my mother was pregnant with me and my mother and father went to a jazz club in Houston called La Bastille. And who did they see and hear? They saw Pharaoh Sanders. And apparently, I was in the womb, and I kicked, and I turned, and I flipped around in utero. <laughs> and even then, his music and presence inspired me as it does today. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> From his, little, his hometown of Little Rock, Arkansas, Farrell was born into a musical family. In high school, he took up the saxophone, learned to play the blues, and never looked back. And it was during his mid-60s work with the great saxophonist John Coltrane that fans and critics alike took notice of this new voice. Farrell's work with Coltrane on the 65 recordings Ascension and the dual tenor Meditations influenced the musical paths and careers of both musicians. Following his work with Train during this period, elements such as chanting became and appeared more prominently in Farrell's work. And in a moment, Farrell's sense of spirituality will be highlighted in a work by NEA jazz master Randy Weston in a song he calls The Healers. Randy selected this piece to perform tonight in dedication to Farrell because Randy said it typified their spiritual connection a connection expressed best not through spoken word, but through music. But first, let's hear more about why Farrell Sanders personifies what it means to be a jazz master. When I first got to New York, I used to be Farrell Sanders as like one of the last great innovators in the music. See, like I've known Farrell forever. There's some people like that in your life, you know. He's a great, great musician. 
I was just trying to see if I could play a pretty note, <laughs> a pretty sound. I kept on trying to improve my sound and trying to perfect my sound. Unique is not even a strong enough word. It's like he's playing like pure light at you. It's way beyond the language. It's way beyond the emotion. It's like taking taking fried chicken and, 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 and gravy to, to space and having a picnic on the moon and you know, listening to Pharaoh. When I try to play music, I'm telling the truth about myself. You hear Pharaoh Sanders, you immediately are filled with joy. For Farrah, I think growing up in a place like Little Rock, Arkansas, where he already has experienced kind of like obscene racism in settings where he's trying to play music. At that time, jobs they would call me about, I had to play behind the curtains. I played uh, lots of jobs like that, you know, behind the curtain. I didn't, I didn't let that stop me. It was confusing to be black for a minute. You were told to sit down and make people dance. It's almost a polite way of saying, just keep skinning and grinning. Tone down your Africanness. And there's only a few in the industry who stayed and still have said their own word. Farrell's one of them. I was listening to blues, blues albums. My father had a collection. I never did go into his collection until he left home. At that time, I was listening to blues. I was listening to people like Nat King Cole, a little bit of Count Basie, definitely Duke Ellison. I learned a whole lot. I met John Handy, another great saxophonist. He had told me, your sound is not here. You need to go to New York so people can maybe listen to you and understand what you're doing. One time he told me, you sound like an organ on the horn. Well, saxophone, you can express yourself more because it's a reed instrument. You can bend notes, you know, you can do so many things uh, with the mouthpiece and read. They influenced other people. When they left town, people liked to dress like Pharaoh. You leave Chicago, next thing you know, everybody's wearing what Pharaoh wore. When we were growing up, if we put on a fan and blow into the fan, you could sound just like Pharaoh. Wow. I mean, we kids, you know, <laughs> we, we don't know nothing. All we know, if you put a fan in front of the saxophone, it'll sound like Pharaoh. <laughs> Now, how he did that without a fan, we have no idea. Pharaoh's music is so powerful because his spiritual soul is powerful. It's almost like that music is, is bursting out of him. It's like he can't contain it, you know, and he has to play just for his own survival, <laughs> you know? Sound, for me, just completely engulfs you. The way that he would phrase and gave energy to the band. I always felt music is very, uh, you know, a spiritual kind of thing. You know, that's what I'm trying to put into my music. It's my language of trying to uh, speak out and, and uh, free myself. He has a, a very special line to a spiritual pool that I don't think most people have, which makes sense as to why John Coltrane would want him to be by his side. I, I was very nervous because uh, play with John Coltrane, uh, a great, great musician like like that. He, I would play a short solo. He's, he would say, no, go on, keep on, keep on playing, you know? And I said, well, okay then. To me, that's what makes his music powerful. It's like he controls the, he controls the evening. He has a way of, of setting up a, a scenario sonically. And in that scenario, there's an introduction and it starts to bring you in. And then as it starts to bring you in, then all of these other variables occur and he takes you on a journey, you know, that you probably wouldn't have expect, expected to be on. And then when he's ready, then he releases you. I go see Farrell Sanders play at the Village Vanguard, plays this amazing set, and then at the end of the set, brings out his prayer bowl. At that moment, you realize you're not in a jazz club anymore, that you're in a spiritual space, and that you've all come there unknowingly to become a congregation. As pure, as his soul is, his music is just as powerful. I never look at the word jazz. I just play. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome NEA Jazz Master Randy Weston and Billy Harper. When I first got to New York, we used to view Pharrell Sanders as like one of the last great interviews. 
in music. It seemed like I'd known Pharaoh forever.
Ladies and gentlemen, 2016 NEA Jazz Master Pharaoh Sanders. I'm so overwhelmed. It's, I don't know what to do. Uh, thank God for Redding Weston, Billy Harper. And God bless you. I feel like. All I can say, the Creator has a master plan. And bless all of you, the Creator of all things, the universe. And I love what uh, Archbishop, how he put, put uh, uh, the history out there. So maybe uh, if you heard him, heard him speak, you know, you know that he's a master and he's a great jazz master. And I really honor um, him for speaking out loud about it in the history, <laughs> the hardships. And I just want to thank the <laughs> the National Endowment for the Arts, and I just love uh, how uh, all the musicians tonight have got together and play all this beautiful music. I don't know what else I can say, but to thank you and thank them, and may they, may they uh, keep on creating this beautiful music you know, all over on this planet. And I just want to make it very short and just say thank you with a lot of love and peace and love to all of you and to my family. Thank you so much. Sanders and congratulations. We have two more special parts of this evening's concert and before we move into the next part I want to take this opportunity to share my thanks again from the National Endowment for the Arts to all of you here tonight at the Kennedy Center and to those watching from around the world online. We really value your support of this wonderful American art form and the month of April is Jazz Appreciation Month 
but we hope that this evening's concert will inspire you to explore this music well beyond this month. And now for our final guest of honor. Tonight's final awardee is certainly known by everybody in the jazz industry, and we want to spread the word about Wendy Oxenhorn, who is receiving this year's... That's right. She's receiving this year's A.B. Spellman NEA Jazz Masters Award for Jazz Advocacy. The uh, Jazz Advocacy Award is named after A.B. Spellman, a jazz writer, accomplished poet, and former deputy chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, and we're so pleased that Mr. Spellman is here in the audience with us this evening. Wendy Oxenhorn grew up in Brooklyn. She started out on a path to be a professional ballerina, but an early injury sent her on a different career journey, a journey which would lead her to identify a passion for helping others in need, and which took her all the way to her role today as the executive director and vice chair of the Jazz Foundation of America. The foundation's mission is to provide financial, medical, and legal assistance to jazz musicians who find themselves in difficult situations due to illness, age, or underemployment. And one of Wendy's most ardent fans, 2003 NEA jazz master Jimmy Heath, Jimmy's famous song, Gingerbread Boy, will soon swing into action this evening. But first, let's watch this video with an all-star cast who describe Wendy's tireless passion to help right what is wrong and who note that the reasons that Wendy Oxenhorn is worthy of the title NEA Jazz Master for Jazz Advocacy. Nobody I know that loves us like Wendy and love us when we're sick and we're not able. That's the difference, you know. There's such a suburban term that people have used, and I've jumped on a bandwagon with them. They use the term angel. Wendy is an angel. Wendy's a spirit. The creator definitely said Wendy. Music entered my life very young. My parents had gotten me a little radio, and I think that was my first real music memory of happiness. From the time I was four, I fell in love with dance. We would dance hours and hours a day, and after ninth grade, I just, I just dropped out. All I wanted to do was dance. And then I had a, a really terrible injury. The doctor said my, my, the inside of my kneecaps were wearing away and that I would never be able to dance. He said, you'll be crippled by the time you're 30 if you continue. I remember I called up a suicide hotline because telling me I couldn't dance, you've just ruined my life and I didn't think I could go on. When I called up the suicide hotline, this woman answered and we were talking and she started to tell me her problems, probably because I asked how things were going for her. And three days later, I was working at the suicide hotline, helping other people who were in trouble, and it saved my life. And that's really how I got into this business of helping people. You think everything is over. Sure enough, um, it just leads you to what you're supposed to be doing next. All these wonderful people uh, started the Jazz Foundation. And then a couple of years later, Dizzy Gillespie got cancer. And he was at Englewood Hospital, and they were helping him. And they said, Dizzy, you know, what can we do? And he said, you can treat all the uninsured musicians. I remember I was really depressed. I was sitting at a cafe, and a friend of mine had seen me playing in the subways. And she goes, this is going to sound crazy, but I know your charitable background. And I bet you would be great at this job. They need a director at a place called the Jazz Foundation of America, and it's helping these elderly musicians. I was like, you're kidding. So I went for the interview. I was the only one who showed up for the interview. And when I told them that I played harmonica in the train stations, <laughs> the president stood up, shook my hand, and said, kid, you're in. I started working for free, and we just started helping people that were uninsured that have had their lives changed. There are musicians out there that 
have had heart attacks, where they're getting old, they can't pay their rent, and they're about to be evicted, we have to do something for them. This is helping people who would never ask for help. This is helping people who work six and seven nights a week till three in the morning for next to nothing. And she actually puts a light on them in a positive way. Not to clap or whatever, she actually gets money for them. There's a cavalry that comes in moments of unexpected difficulty. Anyone can reach out for help. I think it's an incredible humanitarian effort that she's made possible. When I was studying at William Patterson and I was meeting all these wonderful people, I met Wendy Oxenhorn. I was having some problems with my hands. She helped me in a very direct way. What a fabulous human being Wendy is. The doctor said I wasn't going to be able to move for the next nine months. So for nine months, the Jazz Foundation, they gave me free physical therapy. I feel like it's the only way I got better. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> it helps young and old. She helped me a lot. Jazz Foundation helped me to get some new ears at a time when I needed it. Whenever I see Wendy, the subject is always to help people, to help musicians. That's what I love about our Jazz in the Schools program. We're able to employ people that are too old to work any other place, give them this meaningful ability to play for the kids who love them, run up and ask for their autographs after, and they have a reason to wake up again instead of being alone in an apartment, and they have a way to pay their rent or their phone bill. <laughs> I just really want to give credit and thank the people who made the music. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome NEA Jazz Master Jimmy Heath, Lakeisha Benjamin, and Justin Coughlin.
Ladies and gentlemen, 2016 NEA Jazz Master, Wendy Oxenhorn. Thank you guys, there are so many people I love here tonight, it's really touching. Um, and I just wanted to say, you know, that was such a nice film, but they, they, they didn't get the real backstory. Um, the reason why I wanted to become a ballet dancer was because of music. I started listening to jazz and blues very early on, and by the age of 10, I wanted to be a Raylette. <laughs> I'm serious. And when my mother um, broke it to me that I wasn't black, <laughs> I, I went into ballet because... <laughs> And, and the thing is, you know, it's the thing that makes you dance, the thing that makes you want to dance and be a dancer is music. So um, we're all here for that amazing gift that I'd like to say is um, the only legal mood-altering substance. <laughs> and, um, and it's healthy. <laughs> um, it's, it's on the tails of what everyone has said before, but um, we all know what this music was born from and where it came and the response of pain. And I think our whole lives are always a reaction to pain, right? And it leads to our freedom. And the crazy thing is that when you're in the middle of the pain, all you can think of is how to get out of it because it's so uncomfortable. And um, when when this music was created and why it was created. Look what we got. We got this amazing, joyful sound that, that took us all. I don't know anyone here who has not been inspired by Muddy Waters, by Little Walter, by um, everyone that's been mentioned on stage here tonight, by Led Zeppelin, by David Bowie. All this came from spirituals, jazz, and blues. And the people that suffered for it gave us this beautiful joy. And um, what I wanted to say was, that we're, you know, nothing new under the sun. We're in this place in this time where I think there's so much pain out there. And it's, it's really up to us. And that's what I love about the Jazz Foundation. We all, all we do is just love people. That's all we do. When there's a crisis, we love them through it, you know? Just like, and, and I just want to say that um, there are people that do this with me. We have our president, Jarrett Lillian. We have our chairman, Dick Parsons. We've got amazing Danny Glover. We've got the people who do this every day with me, our staff, um, Joe Petroselli, Elisa Hafkin, Daryl Dunbar, and Peter Werner, and all the others at the office. And this, I want to hear an applause for them because you don't do this alone. <laughs> and, it's the people who give to our organization, people like Agnes Varis and her trust, who made, when Katrina happened and we had a thousand musicians without homes, it was Agnes who gave us the money to put them to work in the schools, whatever state they were displaced to. Everyone was bust. I know if it was Westport, Connecticut, the Holiday Inn would have opened their doors. But in New Orleans, people were bust to different states and they were stuck and crazy things happened. And because of people like Agnes Varis, because of people like Mike Novogratz and Suki Novogratz, they gave the money to allow us to put them to work in the schools, and they started their lives over. They could pay rent, and that's something else we do. We pay rent for people when they're um, ill or they've had accidents and crisis. And I wasn't gonna go into all this because you heard all that, but I, I get on a roll. <laughs> and, um, and really what I wanna say is that um, it's really all up to us, you know? I, I used to, I used to wait for the day, the payoff day, you know, like when you find your soulmate, when you find, you know, all these things that are the payoff day and then life changes, right? It happens and everything goes south for a minute. And that's what happened. That's why I picked up the harmonica. I was in love like you don't know. I found my soulmate. It was amazing. He was an Italian composer. Shoot me. <laughs> and of course, you know, it ended tragically. <laughs> And I picked up the harmonica, and that gave me a freedom I have never felt since the ballet. 
And that's what this music is all about. It's to give us freedom. And if there is anyone in this room who has not had their life saved by their records, you know, the, the, it's the people sitting here that I am honored enough and lucky enough to be sitting next to that saved all our lives, right? <laughs> So with that, I just want to wish you all beautiful lives, the rest of your lives. May it be filled with love and, and be the love that you, that you try to seek because that's really all it is. We are all connected. We're all one. Your success is my success. Your failure is my failure. And so I just wish us all today to just go forth in this crazy political climate that we're in and know it's all going to work out because it, doesn't it always? Are you still sitting here, right? It's got to be all right. And so I love you all. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you so much. Did I say I love my mother and father and my children? I love my children and they're here. Thank you. For the kids, for the kids. Wow, I mean, what a, what a, what a night. Uh, I want to thank, you know, our amazing rhythm section, uh, Linda O <laughs> on bass, Linda O. I also want to thank Kareem Riggins on drums, who was also DJing earlier tonight. Kareem Riggins. It's really wonderful. And what a night. So thanks for everyone for coming out to celebrate the 2016 NEA Jazz Masters. And many thanks to Jane Chu and Deborah Rutter and Ann Meyer Baker. And thanks to all of you watching and tweeting online. And we'd like to close things out with a tune by the late NEA master, my homeboy, Dr. Billy Taylor. Here's a piece that he wrote called, I Wish I Knew How It Would Feel to Be Free, for which I'd like to welcome to the stage our featured vocalist for the evening as we close things out, Ms. Catherine Russell.
Sanders and Archie Shep. We are the music. Thank you all. Have a good night. <laughs>